So it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you, Johan Hari. Hi. Uh, I feel I should start by apologizing for two things, actually maybe three things. Um, one is for my accent. I, I only realized after I spent quite a lot of time in the US how many people literally can't understand what I'm saying. I went into a, um, a, a diner in, in Tyler County in Texas and I said to the woman, uh, hi, could I have some pancakes please? And she looked at me and she said, what? <laughs> and I said, oh, hello, could I, could I have some pancakes? And she said, do you speak English? <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, well, my people invented it. <laughs> Uh, and she said, what? <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm going to try to speak more slowly than I normally do to, to compensate. Um, I should also apologize for one other thing, which is um, for the last week, I've been practicing saying Manadnock, and I keep thinking I get it wrong. <laughs> so please do not be offended if I miss saying the name. The other thing is, because um, I've waved my hands around, tell me if I do this. I often hit the microphone like that, and. Um, I kept thinking about that because uh, when I, when I uh, did my TED talk, they put one of those head microphones on you. And when, uh, it was the first time I'd ever worn one, and the guy putting it on me, I said, uh, you know, oh, whenever you put, uh, you know, putting this microphone on, I feel like Madonna. And he paused and said, you should always feel like Madonna. And I, <laughs> I thought it was the most perfectly American thing anyone ever said to me. Um, I, have, I have not come to tell you bad news. You don't need me to tell you the bad news, right? You've heard the bad news, you know the figures. For the first time, the Nobel Prize winning economists discovered earlier this year, for the first time in the entire history of the American Republic, average male life expectancy for white men is falling. And the biggest single cause is addiction. It's not the only cause, but it's the single biggest one. You don't need me to tell you that you're losing 29 people a day to the opioid crisis. There are people in this audience who've lost children to that crisis. Um, what I want to talk to you is about something a bit different, which is that I've been to places where they had crises proportionately just as bad as what's happening here, and they turned it around. And they did it by doing things that are quite different to what we're doing now, but that we can choose to do if we want to. The, the reason why I wanted to look into this was a very um, personal one. One of my earliest memories was of uh, trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I didn't, um, I didn't understand why, because I was a little boy, but as I got older, I realized we had a drug addiction in my family, several members of my family. And I guess it's a difficult thing to say, but if we're honest, one of the reasons I think the debate about the war on drugs is so charged is because I think it runs through the hearts of all of us. All of us have a bit of us when we look at people with addiction problems, that thinks, God, you must be going through real pain, this is terrible, you need a lot of compassion. And if we're honest, I think almost all of us have a kind of drug warrior in us as well, that looks at them and thinks, someone should just stop you. And I was, you know, someone should force you to stop doing this crazy, terrible thing. And I think one of the reasons I went on the journey to write the book and went to so many different countries, I wanted to look at the places where they had tried the toughest, harshest possible policies. I went to Vietnam where they make drug addicts, they put them into work camps, forced work camps. Uh, I went to Arizona, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and I went to places that adopted the most compassionate possible policies. Um, I wanted to see the difference in the results. I wanted to see if I could resolve that conflict in myself. I wanted to see what actually works so that we can set aside the, the or not set aside, but think differently about the charged emotions that we all bring to this topic. And I guess it comes down to me, I think, you know, I've been meeting so many people here in Keene and talking to so many people, I want to talk about them in a minute, but I think before everything else, it comes down to a, a core decision. And, and to, to talk about that core decision, I want to talk about somewhere that's a little bit far away from here and quite different, and I don't want you to think I'm talking about it because I think that, that people here are, are like that, but I think it illustrates something that's also going on in a different way here. I, went, I wanted to talk about the, I wanted to figure out what's going on in the American prison system when it comes to people with addiction. And I knew the situation was pretty extreme in Arizona. So I went to Maricopa County in Arizona. And because I knew it was kind of notorious, there they make women go out on chain gangs wearing t-shirts saying, I was a drug addict. 
and they force them to dig graves while members of the public jeer at them. And I went out with these women and I talked to them, these kind of broken, shamed women. And just before I arrived, I, I, I phoned round um, people who work in the prison system. It's just fact, people who monitor the prison system. There's, there's an amazing woman called Donna Leone Ham. She works for an organisation that monitors prisoners' rights in Arizona. And I said to her a question that I ask lots of people everywhere I go, I said, tell me about something that shocked you in the time you've been doing this work. And she went down a big long list, and somewhere down the list, eighth or ninth, she said, there was the time they put that woman in a cage and cooked her. That, that was really bad. And then she carried on. And I, I, I said, I did the facial expression that all of you guys just did, and I said, sorry Donna, can we go back a second? What, what, what was that? There was a woman called Marsha Powell. Nothing was known about her when I started doing the research, except that she was a woman in her 40s who kept being arrested either for having crack and meth or for prostituting herself to get crack and meth. And one morning she woke up in a prison in Arizona and she was suicidal. And she was screaming and she wanted to die. And the psychiatrist who was on duty that day said she was faking. And they took her to shut her up and they put her in what would be called like a kind of holding cell, like when you checked into the prison, it's a holding cell. By law, you're only allowed to be put there for 45 minutes because it's a cage in the desert, it's an uncovered cage in the desert. And they put Marsha Powell there. And what happened next is disputed. If you believe the prison guards, they forgot about her. If you believe the other prison, which seems implausible given that she was screaming and they were not very far away, but okay, that's what they say. If you believe the other prisoners, they mocked her and they jeered at her. And she, when she begged for water and she messed herself, they laughed at her. Either way, she eventually collapsed. And when they finally called an ambulance, she had been cooked. That's not the most shocking thing about what happened to Marsha Powell. The most shocking thing is what happened next. Nobody was punished for what happened to Marsha Powell. Nobody was criminally prosecuted. And if you want to think about why that is, I think it's because we've made it unconsciously, we've made a choice that addicts' lives at some basic level don't matter, like my life and your life matters. I, I then went and found out who Marsha Powell was. I tracked down the father of her children. She was thrown out of her home when she was 13. She ended up sleeping on the beach. She started prostituting herself as a child when she was 13. She'd be, well, in other words, being raped for money by men, adult men. And uh, to cope with the pain and the grief of that, she started using drugs very, very early. And she carried on all through her life. There was actually a period of her life when she fell in love with this guy, Rich Hussman, and he helped her turn her life around. And she, she actually had a really good few years. She got a job and she was really loving her life. And she came back to Arizona to reclaim custody of her daughter, who she always felt haunted that she'd lost custody of. And she had an outstanding marijuana possession charge. And they busted her and she was sent back to jail. And her whole life unraveled again and she ends up in that cage. Um, the reason why I say that's closer than we'd like to think I went and spoke to Dr. Amy Matthews who, at the hospital here, amazing person, does work rescuing people with overdoses, um, obviously emergency care for addicts. Once they've done the emergency care, she said the elephant in the room is, we've got almost nowhere to send them. There's almost no resources, we're not spending any money on this. Now that doesn't mean you're cooking people in cages, but given what we know about how to save people's lives, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, if you choose not to spend the money, it's not so different. Um, and I was thinking as I, I spoke to people here in Keene, this is one of the epicenters, this part of New Hampshire is one of the epicenters of the crisis, but I kept thinking about something someone said to me in Mexico a few months ago. Um, he said, in nature, apparently, you know, antidotes for a poison, you always find the antidote very close to where you find the poison, that obviously they evolve together. And I thought that about, about here because there are so many people here, a lot of them in this room, who I think, this is not, the, the solution does not lie from somewhere else and bringing things up. The solution is already here. It's in listening to the people who are already here. Uh, I'll just mention some of them and then show how I think they relate to, to the wider evidence. So uh, Rick Van Wickler, the, the, who's the head of the correctional facility here, he has inspired people all over the world. He's an incredibly brave uh, person running a, a jail who says, you know what, we shouldn't have most of these people in this jail. 75% of the people in your jail have addiction problems. Most of them are there because they're being punished 
for having addiction problems. I went and spoke to lots of these women. They were a lot like Marsha Powell. These are, and a lot like the women who were made to go out on that chain gang in Tent City. They are broken people. They are people in a great deal of pain who were trying desperately to block out their pain with the only substance, that, the only thing they were being offered that took away their pain. Um, and, and, and so Rick, I think, has done two really important things. One is make the prison as humane as a prison like that can be. And the other is to publicly advocate and say, these, most of these people shouldn't be here. Clearly, people who commit acts of violence should be imprisoned, and we need to uh, be protected from them. Most of these people are not like that, and they should not be there. They should be somewhere very different, and I'll, I'll talk about that. There, there's a, um, a, an amazing guy called Doug Yarsway, who, whose job there is to you know, ha make sure the people who are leaving are connected with something. So, 20% uh, of the people are leaving to being homeless. Well, what chance have they got of, of you know, recovering from their addiction? His job is to <coughs> hook them up with whatever he can connect them to, but he's facing the same problem as Amy Matthews in the hospital. There's, he's, it's like you're running up a down escalator, right? There's nowhere to refer these people. And on top of that, because we've got a system of criminalizing and punishing them, they're not going to work in the legal economy again. We've put a massive barrier between them and reconnecting. They've got criminal records. They've been shamed. They've been stigmatized. We've rigged the odds against them ever getting back to a decent life. It's not that it's impossible, but we've made it much harder. There's um, Amanda Baldwin, who, who's an amazing state representative here, who everyone should be so proud of. Uh, who, you know, one of the best representatives in the United States consistently advocating for looking at the evidence and looking at what really works and setting aside the, 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 the anger that we naturally have. Um, uh, Tim Fisher, you know, most pregnant women in most parts of the United States don't go for prenatal care because they're terrified and they'll be shamed and they'll be stigmatized. People here should be so proud that you have a doctor who's reached out to those women and is helping them. It will save a lot of those babies' lives, it will turn around a lot of those babies' lives, and it will turn around a lot of those women's lives. And it's a real sign of the, the font of compassion that is here, that he's had so much support for doing that. In Oklahoma, where you know, they're actually prosecuting women with, for attempted murder or manslaughter who have addiction problems during, during pregnancy, which of course guarantees that no woman's going to come forward with prenatal care, and guarantees that loads of babies will be horribly injured. Um, that's obviously uh, Linda Rubin, who, who I, I'm so inspired by, by the work that you're doing here. And I actually think it's a real connection between the, the work you're doing here for advocacy for people with addiction problems and the wider advocacy for the living wage that you've launched. And I want to talk about that in a second. The people at 100 Nights, the homeless shelter. You know, the wisest people I've met since I came to Keene were the people that I went and met who were going through the drug court. The, not the people running the drug court, I'm afraid to say, but the people going through it. Um, who had a really sophisticated understanding of what had gone wrong and what help they needed and the love they needed and a really sophisticated analysis, frankly more impressive than some Harvard psychologists I went and interviewed about this. Um, I'm so impressed that I'm in a place where the Chamber of Commerce comes and introduces someone who's giving a message like the one I'm giving. That's not true of most places in the United States and it's another reason people should be, should be really proud. It's a real lesson that the, the most sophisticated people in this situation know that we are all connected. And you see that in a place like this in a way it's easier to hide from it in a, in a big city. Um, if we want to understand the alternatives, I think we have to start with a question that I kind of thought I knew the answer to uh, and I realised I'd been getting profoundly wrong all my life which is the question of what causes addiction. If you had said to me five years ago when I started doing the research on this, what causes, say, heroin addiction, I would have looked at you like you were a bit stupid. <laughs> and I would have said, well, the clue's in the name. <laughs> it's called heroin addiction. It's caused by heroin, right? Um, we've got a story that we've been told for 100 years that I literally thought I had seen play out in front of me. So we think, if we kidnap the next you know, 20 people to walk past this, you know, the building we're in, uh, and we forcibly injected them all with heroin for a month. At the end of that, they'd all be heroin addicts. For a simple reason, there are chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to physically need. And at the end of that, they'd have this ravenous hung physical hunger for heroin. And that's what addiction is. That's definitely what I believed. Um, the first thing that led to me to the fact there's something not right about that is when it was explained to me by lots of doctors in most of Europe and in Western Europe and in Canada, if, say you break your hip, you get hit by a car and you break your hip, or you need a hip replacement as you get older. You go to hospital and you're given, lot, for the pain, you're given a lots, lots of a drug called diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's just a medical name for heroin. 
All over Europe and Canada, people are being given heroin in hospitals for quite long periods of time. If what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused by the chemical hooks, what should happen to all these people? They're being exposed to as many of the chemical hooks as anyone you'll go find in Phoenix House, as anyone you'll go find in, in um, you know, 100 Nights, right? This has been studied very carefully. Addiction in that context is virtually never happens. It's exceptionally rare. And that seemed to me when I learned it, I had to look at the science like that. It seems so weird and so contrary to everything I've been told. So what you're saying that you could have someone in a hospital bed who's being given lots of heroin and they don't become addicted and you've got someone in the alleyway outside shooting up and they do become addicted and it's the same drug. What, how could that be? What does, it didn't make sense. And it's when I didn't really believe it and I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an amazing professor of psychology there called Bruce Alexander. Who, who, who did an experiment that I think helps us to understand what's really going on and to find the way out, and actually helps us to understand what's going on here in New Hampshire. So he explained to me, theory of addiction we've all got in our heads, the chemical hooks theory, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're, they're really simple experiments. You guys can try them at home if you feel a little bit sadistic. You, you get a rat, rat, and you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself within about a week. So there you go, right? Totally fits with everything we think. It's partly where the story comes from. In the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and said, well, hang on a minute. We're putting this rat in an empty cage alone where it's got nothing else to do. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats, right? Anything a rat can want in life is there in Rat Park. It's got loads of cheese, it's got loads of coloured balls, it's got loads of tunnels, it's got loads of friends, it can have loads of sex. Anything a rat can want. And it's got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water, and of course they try both because they don't know what's in them. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. Sometimes they get together and use it all together and scamper around a little bit manically and what looks awfully like a rat party, but none of them developed <laughs> compulsive use. And none of them died. So you went from almost 100% overdose when their lives are terrible to none when their lives are good. Now, it's easy to, you know, Think about that in relation to rats. There are loads of human examples. You are living through human examples, but I'll give you one. Um, there was actually a human example happening at the same time as Rat Park. It was called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, 20% of American troops were using loads of heroin out there. And if you look at the news reports from the time, they were really worried. You know, because they were like, my God, when the war ends, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of, as they would have put it, junkies on the streets of the United States. What are we going to do? There was a study that followed these soldiers home. Very few of them went to rehab. Um, very few of them got any help. 95% of them just stopped. Didn't want to use it anymore. And if you believe the old theory that people have taken over by chemical hooks, that makes absolutely no sense. But if you understand this different way of thinking about it, it makes perfect sense. If you're taken out of your home and sent to a horrific pestilential jungle where you don't want to be, and you're forced to, you could be killed at any moment, and you're forced to you know, attack people, well, I think we'd all be much more likely to want to anaesthetise ourselves. And then you go back to your nice life in Wichita, Kansas, or wherever you're from, with your meaning, your purpose, and your friends, and your family. Well, you're a lot less likely to want to anaesthetise yourself. There's a guy in, in Amsterdam, a professor called Peter Cohen, who says we shouldn't even call it addiction. We should call it bonding. Human beings have an innate need to bond and connect. And when we're happy and healthy, we'll bond and connect with the people around us. But if you can't do that, because you're isolated, or you're traumatized, or you're beaten down by life. You're gonna bond and connect with something that gives you some sense of meaning. That could be alcohol, that could be gambling, that could be pornography, that could be heroin. But you're gonna bond with something that gives you some sense of meaning. And actually gambling is a good example. You know, go and meet a gambling addict, go to a meeting of Gamblers Anonymous. They're as addicted as any heroin addict or any alcoholic you'll ever meet. 
but you don't snort a roulette wheel, you don't inject a pack of cards, right? There's no chemical involved, and yet they're just as addicted. That tells you something about how we've overrated the role of chemicals. The chemicals do play a role and they can cause harm, of course, but it's not the core of the problem. And it took me a long time to understand that. And in a way, it's, it was explained to me, you know, I've got here a bottle of water, um, overpriced bottle of water, and, um, you know, you guys, lots of you have got coffee or whatever. Forget the drug laws, totally legally, we could all be drinking vodka now, right? There's, I'm sure there's somewhere we could buy vodka, not very far from here. We probably, we could all drink vodka for the next month and we wouldn't end up homeless, right? The reason we're not gonna do that is not because anyone's stopping us. The reason we're not gonna do that is because we want to be present in our lives. We've got people we love, we've got places, we, we've got things we love doing, we've got connection and meaning and purpose. The core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. Now, I know this can sound a bit abstract. Um, there are places that acted on it. So that, those women on that chain gang in Arizona, they leave, and it's not just, sometimes people say it doesn't work, it's much worse than that. It makes their addiction worse. Once you understand that pain and isolation are drivers of addiction, suddenly you realize why inflicting more pain and more isolation doesn't work. When I was in that prison, uh, the women were terrified of a place they called the hole. And I asked the guards if they would take me to the hole. I was sure they wouldn't. They said, yeah, sure, because they enjoy the pantomime of cruelty. And I went there, and there were women who were put there, and it's a hole, I and mean, it's actually a concrete hole. And they're put there for 28 days, and there's nothing, they have no contact. And I looked at that, and I suddenly thought, ah, oh, this is the closest you could get to an exact human replica of the cages that guaranteed addiction in rats. And we're doing this thinking it'll make these women stop being addicted. You know, but that continues, oh, sorry, see what I mean about hitting microphones. Um, you know, that continues all the way through, right? What does a criminal record do? It prevents people from reconnecting. It puts a barrier between them and reconnection. There's a place that tried the opposite. So Portugal, in the year 2000, had a worse drug problem than you have now. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. Um, it was a complete disaster. And they had all the problems you have on steroids. And every year they tried the American approach more. They arrested more people, they imprisoned more people, and every year the problem got worse. And one day the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together, and they said something really radical, something no one had done since the war on drugs had started 80 years before. They said, should we ask some scientists to figure out what would solve this? And they set up a panel of scientists and doctors, and they said to them, you guys go away, figure out what would solve this, and we've agreed in advance we'll do whatever you recommend. I don't think they figured that they were going to recommend something quite like they did, but you know, to be fair, they kept their word. So the panel led by an amazing man, I got to know Khao Gulao, went away, and they looked at the evidence, including the evidence from Rat Park and everything that flows from it, and they came back and said, decriminalise all drugs. The 75% of people who are in your correctional facility, let them out. And take all that money, all the money we currently spend, on making addicts' lives worse and spend it instead on making their lives better. Now, some of that is what we think of as treatment. So they do do some residential rehab and psychological support, and that does have real value. But the biggest thing they did is the opposite of what we do. So criminal records, shame, stigma. What they did in Portugal was they set up a huge program of job creation for addicts. Say you used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. They set up a big program of microloans for addicts so they could set up and run small businesses that they would help them run. The goal was to say to every addict in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back, you should have as good a life as anyone else you pass on the street. And I went to see this, I went to see some of the, the treatment, it was really fascinating. Some of it seemed almost absurdly basic at first, it really helped me to understand it. The, the, there were, for example, people with bad addiction problems who come in, one of the things they, are, they were getting them to do was just pull a face that they associated with an emotion and hold it for 30 seconds, an emotion like sadness or anger. And they couldn't do it. It was too painful. It was about learning how to be present with those emotions without being out of it, without being you know, uh, uh, intoxicated. I was talking to the women about that uh, at the drug court program yesterday, and they were talking about how hard it is for them to sit with those feelings after the lives they've had. The results are now in, in Portugal. It's been 15 years since they started it. When I went there, it was two years ago, so 13 years. 
Injecting drug use fell by 50%, 50%. Overdose massively fell. HIV massively fell. Street crime massively fell. They have five political parties in Portugal. It's a competitive political system. None of them want to go back. I, I went and interviewed a guy called Juan Figuera, who was at the time the top drug cop in Portugal. And he led the opposition to the decriminalization. And he said what lots of people totally reasonably say when you talk about this, which is, surely if we decriminalize all drugs, we'll have a huge increase in drug use. We'll have all sorts of problems. We'll have children using drugs. We'll have, you know, catastrophe. And, and, and Juan Figuera said to me, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked about how he felt really ashamed looking back that he'd spent 20 years before the decriminalization doing what he now realized was making addicts worse when he could have been helping them and turning their lives around. I want to talk about another place that did something a bit different. Uh, it's related to Portugal, but it's different. Switzerland was the other European country with a massive heroin crisis at that time in the year 2000. You probably remember there were famous images that went all over the world, just chaotic heroin use all over the streets of Switzerland, which is really shocking. In Switzerland, actually, my dad's from Switzerland, as, as you mentioned, and Switzerland's quite a lot like New Hampshire. It's, you know, largely rural, you know, in some ways quite socially conservative, but caring, has strong community values. And um, Swiss people were really shocked. It's a lot like New Hampshire. It's like, what is this? What's going on? Why would people do this? And they tried lots of different things. They tried really harsh punishment. It, 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 the problem got worse. And they had a president, the first female president of Switzerland, an amazing woman called Ruth Dreyfus. And she decided to try an experiment, which was to legalize heroin for addicts in a very specific way. So um, what she explained to people is, she said, I've got a suspicion. When we talk about legalization, what people picture is anarchy and violence and chaos. It seems to me what we've got now is anarchy. We've got unknown drug users buying unknown chemicals from unknown criminals, all in the dark. What would happen if we restored order to this anarchy? So the way it works is, you, is obviously you can't just go into the equivalent of CVS and buy heroin. No one's in favor of that. What happens is you're assigned to, a, you've got a heroin problem, you're assigned to a clinic, you go to that clinic, they give you the heroin there, you have to use it there, you can't take it out with you because they don't want people to sell it on. And also they want to monitor you while you use it, you're monitored by a nurse, and then you leave. And it's the striking thing, you leave to go to your job. While you're in the program, they give you a huge amount of support to turn your life around. They help, they make sure you've got housing, they make sure you've got, uh, you get a job, um, they, they have, give you psychological support. And there's something that really struck me about this program. You can stay on that program as long as you want. There's never any pressure to cut back. And you can set your own dose of heroin. They won't give you one that would literally kill you. But apart from that, you set your own dose. You stay as long as you want. So even though the program began more than 10 years ago, you could stay on it for 10 years. You could stay on it forever. Um, but what really struck me is almost everyone chooses to reduce their dose over time. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes five years. But almost everyone reduce, reduces their dose over time and, and stops. And I said to Rita Mangi, who's the psychiatrist who runs that program, why is that? And she, why, why do people choose to stop? Because it doesn't fit with, we're told that the drug takes you over and you know. And she said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but well, their lives get better. You know, if you're a woman who was prostituting yourself, you stop. If you're a man who was committing property crime, you stop. Um, if you were just in a constant chaotic scramble, you stop, you get back to a normal life, you get housing and a job. And so you want to be present in your life more. And, and that really helped me again to see the, the difference. I'll give you the two most important facts about the Swiss heroin legalization. Do you know how many people have died of overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? Zero. Not a single person. Not one. There are 29 people dying a day in the United States at the moment of heroin overdoses. Um, the other crucial fact is that Switzerland is a super, you know, actually more than New Hampshire, is that they would definitely be Trump supporters. Uh, it's a really conservative place, right? Uh, my, my, my grandmother got the vote in 1973, to give you some sense of, I don't be probably too soon for Donald Trump, but um, the, the um, sorry, I'll take that back, it's a non-partisan event. Um, but the, the uh, you know, so this is not San Francisco. And yet Swiss people, and it was hugely controversial when it was introduced to heroin legalization, as you can imagine, massively controversial. People thought Ruth Dreyfus was crazy. And they had it in place for a year, and then they had a referendum on it. And 70% of Swiss people voted to keep heroin legal. 
one of the biggest referendum victories they've had in Switzerland. And interestingly, part of it was compassion for addicts, and that was important. But actually, a lot of it was just crime fell so much that even quite conservative people who didn't give a damn about heroin addicts didn't want their car radio stolen. I mean, you look at the statistics on, the, on crime, there was just, an in, I think the figure was, it's in the book, 78% fall in car thefts. But we're talking huge fall in crime. Um, and I kept thinking about that when I was in the correctional facility here and talking to Rick, who's done an amazing job in making that a properly humane prison. But as he, you know, as the people there point out, and as the women were explaining to me, so we're being treated well here, and they're gonna go out to what? There's no resources, there's no housing, there's no rehab, there's no support, there's no, and what you really need is long-term support, you know, taking, taking the rat out of the cage for a few days and then putting it back in the cage doesn't really do anything, right? What you need is a long-term change. Bruce Alexander, who did the Rat Park experiment, said to me at some point, at one point, we talk all the time in addiction about individual recovery, and that has real value, it's important. We need to talk much more about social recovery. Something's gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And for everyone whose addiction manifests in this you know, disastrous way, there's a lot more people who are depressed, dissatisfied, you know, developing compulsive relationships to, you know, I, was, I did a talk recently where people had to tell there to switch off their phones, um, you know, before the talk began, and they looked like a bunch of heroin addicts who were told their dealer was gonna be out of town for it, you know. Uh, you know, and obviously I'm not, you know, it's not the same thing. But, you know, it reveals that dissatisfaction spreads much more widely than just the, um, you know, than the people who manifest in the most extreme ways. One of the other things they did in Portugal, particularly Portugal, is they acknowledged something which is also a difficult truth. And one of the few things I was a bit uncomfortable about when the governor was, 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 was talking, um, there were two things actually, I'd say the other thing. <laughs> the, the, this was so different from my family's experience that I found it, a long, it took me a long time to accept it, but the evidence is really clear on this. 90% of all currently illegal drug use isn't addiction, and it isn't harming them. We all know that about alcohol. If we go into a bar in Keene tonight, you know, we'll look around and there'll be some people there who are alcoholics and they need our love and support, but everyone else is just drinking because it makes their lives a bit better. That's actually true of almost all drug use. Uh, again, that really surprised me. Most people who try even the most demonized drugs don't become addicted to them. Which is not to say they're not harmed in other ways. There are other harms associated with those drugs that are very serious. But, um, so in Portugal, there's support and love for addicts, but drug users, they just give them advice on how to use more safely in the same way we do with, with, with alcohol. And I think that's a difficult truth. Presenting all drug use as addiction or putting it all bracketed together, I think does a disservice, because it means we can't get help to the people who need it. And most of those people don't need help, because they're not harming themselves. Um, the, I was thinking in the, in the, the, the jail there, you know, I said to, to Rick, who, who runs it, what would happen if what you say should happen, you know, with ending the war on drugs, what would happen to your jail? And he said, well, it'd be a lot smaller. <laughs> and we wouldn't be spending $6 million um, a, a year. And, is there anyone in this room who can't think of better things to do with that $6 million than take traumatized, broken people and, and warehouse them for a little while? Um, and again, uh, speaking in that prison reminded me of another, another really important piece of evidence that I think should be part of this debate, which is that uh, I learned about it from an amazing man. There's a, a doctor in Vancouver, um, you're texting about him, which might seem a bit weird and irrelevant, but it's really not. He was born in Budapest, at the height of the Holocaust, his mother was Jewish, Judith, her name was. And uh, they ended up trapped in the Budapest ghetto as the, the Nazis were taking over and they were murdering Jews everywhere. Judith didn't know it yet, but her parents had actually already been murdered in, in the death camps at Auschwitz. And one day Judith went up to a, a Christian stranger who came into the ghetto and said, take my baby, I'm gonna die in here, I don't want him to die in here take him. So this woman took her baby and, and Gabor survived. He ended up in Canada, he became a doctor. He worked in a really notorious part of, of Vancouver called the Downtown East Side, uh, which some of you will know, it's kind of has the highest concentration of people with addiction problems in probably the world, but certainly North America. And he was working with really hardcore addicts, the most extreme people with addiction problems. And he, know, and he was kind of talking to them a lot and trying to give them kind of talk therapy. And he noticed something 
that kind of really stuck out at him, which was that whenever you talk to them about their lives, invariably they had had horrific childhoods. They don't mean bad childhoods, horrific childhoods. And he thought, that's, that's interesting. And Gabor himself had a, a weird compulsive behavior. When he felt stressed, he would often just abandon whatever he was doing, leave his kids in public, abandon a woman who was in labor, run off and just compulsively spend money on CDs. He didn't even listen to. He didn't understand it. And he, he went away and did some research and he learned about something called the, I was thinking about this a lot when I was speaking to the women in the drug court, um, something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. It's a really simple study. It was stumbled across by accident. Basically, really easy. You, you approach a huge cross-section of ordinary public and you ask them about two things. One is you ask them about bad things that might have happened to them when they were a kid. There's 10 categories. So like your parent dying, being sexually abused, being severely neglected, that kind of thing. And the second thing is you just ask them about some things that might go wrong in their lives at the moment. Obesity, depression, and one of them is addiction. And then they just see what are the matchups. And they were amazed when they looked at them. For every category of traumatic event that happens to you when you're a kid, you are two to four times more likely to become an adult injecting drug addict. But when you get accumulation of those traumas, it goes off the scale. If you've had six of those categories of trauma, you are 4,600% more likely to become an adult injecting drug addict than if you had none. And at first I thought, oh, is, this like a, is this different to the Rat Park? How does that fit with what I learned about Rat Park? And then it was explained to me, actually by someone who had an addiction problem and had a horrifically traumatic childhood. If you have a really traumatic childhood, you find it really hard to trust the world. You find it really hard to believe people are going to treat you well, because the world has not treated you well at the most formative and important point when you most need love and, and care. And so you're much more likely to isolate yourself. Of course, there are people who have heroically overcome this, but you're much more likely to be cut off. You're much more likely to find it hard to connect. Um, and so you're much more likely to be like those rats in the isolated cage than the rats in the, in the, in the connected cage. And again, it helps you to realize one of the women I spoke to at the drug court, you know, she had been horrifically sexually abused by her grandfather from when she was 10. She actually started using drugs because he gave them to her to, to make it easier to abuse her. Um, and she was, even though a drug court is better than a prison, she's still being shamed. She's still being told there's something, you know, she's still, if she slips up and gets into terrible state of distress and uses a drug, she's still been sent back to jail, right? It's an improvement, but that's not the answer. Um, it's, and it's a, frankly a very minor improvement. Um, I want to talk about one other thing that the governor talked about where I say, I want to say dis well I do disagree with that, yeah, why not say it. Uh, the prescription drug crisis, right? So obviously we've got, we've got the, um, so a big part of this problem is prescription drugs, right? And I think there's been a, 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 a few misunderstandings about this. One is, um, why does it, when it, look at the graph of, prescription drugs when it massively spikes up. It massively spikes up in 2008. Can anyone think of anything that happened in 2008 that would mean a lot of Americans were in a lot of pain, right? Actually, I said this on a radio show and someone said, you mean Obama? And I was like, no, 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 don't mean Obama. <laughs> um, but, the, but, but no, we had the biggest economic crash in living memory, and then we had a massive economic crisis. And a lot of people who were middle class couldn't provide for their families, and a lot of people who were poor couldn't eat. And what happened? A lot of people decided to deal with the psychological pain of that by taking a very powerful painkiller. That's why we've got a prescription drug crisis, right? The idea that it's about the availability of the drug is a misconception. Every one of those people could have gone and bought vodka, right? We have very powerful painkillers that are legal all around us. Um, it's not about the availability. There are questions about the availability. There are ways you can monitor that. But the, the so I think that when, when uh, the governor was saying, so what we're doing is we're monitoring it more so we can restrict it, this is a terrible mistake. Um, what happens in the United States is the opposite. So remember what happened in Switzerland. If you've got an opiate problem, they prescribe it to you and give you support to turn your life around so that you want to be present in your life. What happens here with prescription drugs, rather like with heroin, but even more, is the opposite. If a doctor in the United States discovers that you are using this drug, not for back pain or whatever, but because you're addicted, by law they have to cut you off. If they don't, they can be prosecuted as a drug dealer and sent to prison. That has happened to quite a lot of doctors. So you have to throw people off. What happens when they're thrown off? They're still in pain. They're actually in even greater pain. Um, and they then enter an illegal market. And there's something about an illegal market. This is slightly wonky, and I don't have an emotional way to say it, but 
I think it's really important to understand why there is that transition from um, prescription opiates to heroin, which is massive in driving this problem. And it's because of a weird thing called the iron law, largely, not entirely, because of a weird thing called the iron law of prohibition. Best way to understand it is, the day before alcohol was banned in the United States in the 1920s, the most popular drink by far was beer. Second most popular drink was wine, just like today, right? Within a week of alcohol being prohibited, there was no beer or wine in the United States. You couldn't get hold of them. The most popular drinks were whiskey and moonshine. And you think, well, no, that's like, oh, why would that be? Why would banning the drug change the, the way that people consumed the drug? And it's for a really simple reason. If you imagine we had to smuggle enough alcohol for the nearest bar in Key, in a wagon from the Mexican border or the Canadian border, if we fill that wagon with um, beer, we'll get drink for, what, like 100 people? If we fill it with vodka, we're going to get drink for thousands of people. When you ban a drug, it has to be smuggled, and suddenly there's a premium on getting the biggest possible kick into the smallest possible space. So you will only get the most extreme forms of the drug available at a reasonable price. The, more, uh, the less extreme the drug, the higher the price will go because it's harder to smuggle it, right? So that explains why, for example, we have much stronger forms of cannabis now than we had you know, 40 years ago. The more you crack down, riskier it is to smuggle, the more extreme the content gets. Most people who smoke cannabis don't want to smoke extreme super skunk, just like most people who drink alcohol don't want to drink neat vodka. They want to smoke, you want to drink milder forms of the drink, they want to smoke milder forms of the drug, those forms are not available. You go onto the market, you're thrown off by your doctor, you go onto the market and you've got an opiate addiction, you cannot buy those drugs except at enormously high price because of the iron law of prohibition. What can you buy? Heroin is much cheaper for exactly that reason. That's why there's this transition. So sometimes, and that transition ends when you do what the Swiss did, when you legalize it. That, that, that transition ends. It's why that, they don't have that problem in Switzerland. Um, so the core of dealing with the prescription drug crisis is three things. One is continue prescribing to people who have addiction problems, um, knowing that that's deeply imperfect. Secondly, give those individuals support to turn their lives around. And thirdly, social recovery, so we have a society where people aren't suffering stuff, and that goes to exactly, I think, the stuff that Linda's doing. One of them, one of the most important things is the living wage campaign. If you deal with people's economic insecurity, they're less insecure, they're less anxious, they're less depressed. They are less likely to want to intoxicate themselves. There's really strong evidence about that. So I think the things that you're doing here are totally tied up together. One of the best ways you could, what did they learn in Portugal? Giving people secure jobs was the best way to reduce addiction. You see, these things are densely connected. Things that seem like they have nothing to do with drug policy are closely related to drug problems. Um, I just want to end by uh, talking about one, one other thing that I, I was thinking about a lot when I was speaking to people here in Keene. Um, it, it's about someone I got to know who I really loved. Um, in, in the year 2000, there was a homeless street addict in, in Vancouver, on the downtown east side, that notorious place where there was a huge amount of addiction, called Bud Osborne. He was actually from, not very far from here, but he ended up in Vancouver. And um, he was watching his friends die all around him. What was happening is they had a quite intense crackdown by the police on, on heroin. And so people would shoot up like behind dumpsters or they'd hide in little alcoves in alleyways. And obviously if you're shooting up and you start to overdose and you're hidden, no one sees you and they just find your body like hours later and you're dead. And, and Bud thought, I can't, I can't just watch all these people die. I can't just wait to die myself. But he also thought, as he would have put it, I'm a homeless junkie, what am I going to do? And he had a, had a really small idea, a really simple idea, he gathered together a load of the homeless street addicts, and he said, when we're not using, which is most of the time even for homeless street addicts, why don't we just draw up a timetable, and just between us, no officials, nothing, and we'll just patrol the alleyways, and we'll look in the places we know we all hide, and if we see someone ODing, we'll just call an ambulance. And people were kind of skeptical, but they liked Bud, and they went, oh, do it. And they started doing this, and the death toll on the downtown east side had a significant drop because the addicts were saving each other. And you know, that was a good thing in itself, obviously, when people who were dying, who would have died, lived. But it also meant the addicts started to think about themselves a little bit differently. They were like, oh, maybe we're not the pieces of rubbish everyone says we are. Maybe we can do something. So they got together and they formed a group they called Vandu, a Vancouver area network of drug users. And they, there were lots of public meetings at the time about like, the menace of the addicts. 
And they would go to the meetings, they'd sit at the back, and after a little while, Bud or someone would pop his hand and go, I think you're talking about us. Is there anything we could do differently? And sometimes people were really angry, and they'd say, oh, you're disgusting. Or sometimes they'd say, well, you leave your needles lying around. And Bud said, well, is there any way we could get a small budget? And we'll collect, well, if you pay us, we could collect the needles. We could sort that out. And they started doing that. And it meant that people started to think a little bit differently about, about drug addicts in, in, in Vancouver. Um, but, you know, it, it still carried on, still a huge death toll. And Bud learned in the local library that in uh, Frankfurt, in Germany, they had opened safe injecting rooms, a bit like Switzerland. You go and you can use your drug there legally and you're monitored by doctors. They don't, in Frankfurt, they didn't give you the drug as well, so it wasn't as good as Switzerland. But, you know, uh, and that this had massively reduced the death toll in Switzerland. Oh, sorry, in Frankfurt. Um, and he thought, great, well, we've got to do that, right? Uh, but no one had done anything like that in North America since the, since the start of the war on drugs nearly 100 years before. But Bud thought, OK, we'll persuade our politicians. And at that time, Vancouver had a right-wing mayor called Philip Owen, who was from a very rich family, he was a very wealthy businessman, he didn't know any drug addicts, kind of right-wing. He'd run for election saying all the drug addicts should be taken and detained at the local military base and never let out. Um, he was very privileged. Uh, uh, if you basically picture Mitt Romney, he was a bit like Mitt Romney. Um, and um, they decided they were going to change his mind, which was like insane. <laughs> They started following Philip Owen everywhere he went in public with a coffin. And the coffin said, who will die next Philip Owen before you open a safe injecting drug room? Every time he spoke at a public meeting, they would stand up and they'd say, who's going to die next Philip Owen before you open a safe injecting drug room? <laughs> and this went on. At one of the meetings, Dean Wilson, one of the members of the group, stood up and said, do you remember the woman who asked you a few weeks ago, who will die next Philip Owen before you open a safe injecting drug room? turned out to be her because you haven't done it yet. And this went on for a long time and people got disheartened. And one day, to his eternal credit, Philip Owen said, who are these people? And he went and he sat with loads of drug addicts and he listened to them and he was totally blown away. He never, he had no idea their lives like this. He thought they were just people who partied too hard and had indulged themselves. He was totally blown away. He came to Chicago to meet the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, who'd grown up under alcohol prohibition, who was really against the drug war, who explained lots of things to him. And Philip Owen came back to Vancouver, to the downtown east side, and he held a press conference. And he had the chief of police, the coroner, and a representative of the addicts. He said, I'm never going to speak about addiction again without having these guys here with me, because they know much better than I do. And we're going to open the first safe injecting room in North America. We're going to have the most compassionate drug policies in North America, and things are going to change around here. Wait and see. And they opened the first safe injecting room. And Philip Owen's party was so horrified they deselected him as their candidate and his career ended. But a more liberal candidate was then elected, beat their guy, and, and they kept the injecting drug room open. And when I went there, it was 10 years since this experiment had begun and the results were in. Deaths from overdose were down by 80% on the downtown east side. And I went and sat with Philip Owen. And he told me it was the proudest thing he'd ever done. And he would sacrifice his entire political career all over again. People kept stopping us on the downtown east side to thank him for what he'd done. He said, how many times as a politician do you get to respond to a movement that can save that many people's vulnerable people's lives? And Bud Osborne, the guy who started the uprising, the homeless street addict, he died uh, a year and a half ago. He was only in his early 60s, but he'd been a homeless addict during a drug war. It takes a toll on you. And when he died, they sealed off the streets of the downtown east side where he had lived as a homeless person. And they had this incredible memorial service and there were loads of people there who knew that they were alive because of what he had started. The Canadian Supreme Court, there was a challenge to the injection room, the Canadian Supreme Court ruled that addicts have an inalienable right to life and that includes a safe place to use drugs. That will never be taken away now. And when I get disheartened about this, and you know, you're up against a big fight, right? If you really want to challenge this, you've got to challenge some of the federal laws. There are things you can do here, but you have to challenge some of the federal laws, and you have to challenge some of the deepest fears of our culture. When I get depressed about that, I think, okay, it's hard to think of a more, home, a more, a more disempowered person in our culture than a homeless street addict. Bud didn't sit there feeling sorry for himself. He didn't say, this is going to be really hard. He didn't cry. He started where he stood, 
And he persuaded people one by one, and other people joined him. And I think about all these amazing people here in Keene who've already started that work, the people in your state house and so many people in New Hampshire who are seeing the alternatives and are looking at the evidence. And you know, like Tim Fisher just said, treats pregnant women here, said to me just before we started, you know, it was about setting aside the ideology and sitting with them as human beings and listening to them. The answers are already here. I heard them in 100 Nights, the homeless shelter. I heard them in the drug court. I heard them in the jail. You guys know the answer to this. And you know, the one thing we can say in defense of the war on drugs is you've given it a fair shot, right? The US has spent 100 years. You've spent a trillion dollars. You know, you have killed hundreds of thousands of people. And you may have noticed drugs have not disappeared. There, there is a sensible way to respond to this that's based, policies based on stigma and shame. You can have as many moral arguments as you like. They don't work. They've been tried, they completely failed. Policies based on love and compassion do work. They don't solve every problem, they're not a magic bullet, but problems get significantly and massively less bad when you choose those approaches. You know, for 100 years, we have been singing war songs about addicts. I just think we should have been singing love songs to them all along. Thank you.